Horizontal asymptotes, well, and oblique ones too. So this one's going to be a little longer. I apologize for that. Um, and it's because there's some big ideas. And then there's going to be one more with special situations that you do have to pay attention to. But this is going to be the straightforward ones. So for horizontal asymptotes and oblique asymptotes, there's really three situations that come into play. And uh, I'm going to, those are my nieces, or some of my nieces, not all of them. I'm going back and looking at some stuff that I put together uh, because this is the fourth time I've tried this because it didn't work out. That's the one I want. I want this guy here. Um, or something like it. I think that's actually not the one I want. I want something more like this. Uh, y equals divide 3x plus 1. Let's go down and go uh, 2x minus 3. Sure. Okay. So I'm going to write that over on the other side, but you can see what's happening here. And uh, we have x equals 3, 2, and y equals, oh, maybe I don't want to do it that way. Let's make that the number 4 instead. And then let's make that. Two. We make this y equals 3 over 2. Yep, that's what I want. Okay, so uh, hopefully we can see what's going on there. And uh, we'll keep that in mind. I'm going to graph it over in Notability as well. So I have this function, f of x, or as I think my parlance was using big R because it's a rational function. And it's made up of, again, a polynomial function divided by some other polynomial function. And so that's what a rational function is. The concrete example that I've given you is over there was 3x plus 2, I want to say, and 2x minus 4, which is kind of weird, but that's okay. It's going to work out. Uh, I'm going to double check that that's what it was. 3x plus 2, 3x plus 1, sorry. I want it to be the same so that when I graph it, it'll... And that, that actually, that number's not going to affect it, but that's okay. So this actually is um, an example of situation one, if we want to call it that. And so I'm going to slide over here. I'm going to make a little table that I'll keep bouncing back to. And so we'll call it horizontal asymptotes. And I'm going to abbreviate here, asymptotes. And so the first situation is when m is equal to n. And when I say m is equal to n, this is what I'm talking about. When I say m is equal to n, my, my format for the function is this. ax to the m plus a whole bunch of stuff, because it could be a whole bunch of stuff, but we don't care about that stuff. And there's a couple ways to talk about it. Um, and whether I will or not is still bouncing around in my head. And the polynomial function on the bottom is going to be b x to the n plus whatever. So when I say m is equal to n, I'm saying that the exponent or the degree of the numerator polynomial is the same as the degree of the, po the denominator polynomial. Okay? So I'm saying that their degrees are the same. So in this case, if I go back and look at this example here, Notice how the degree on the numerator is 1, and the, de the, lead, or the, the degree of the polynomial in the denominator is also 1. So they're the same. So that's the situation we're going to talk about now. So we've hopefully you've watched the video before this. It talks about vertical asymptotes. So let's first find out my vertical asymptote is going to be at x equals what? Well, again, I'm going to take this down here. I'm going to set it equal to 0, and I'm going to do a little algebra and get x equals 2. So my vertical asymptote is going to be at x equals 2. And so I'm going to slide this up, and we're going to graph over here. Well, let's put that. Let's, I always do this not great, because I should just do this. If I hold it, it'll make a nice line, and I never use it. 
because I'm probably a moron in some respects. But not thoughtful, not habitual, whatever. Um, and let's change colors. And so I'm ha I have an asymptote at what x equals 2. So let's say that this is x equals 2. And so I know I'm going to have an asymptote right here. So that means that when I put x equals 2 into this function right here, it creates a denominator of 0. So there are no points at that location, x equals 2. Whether it's above or below, there is there are no points there. That, that dotted line is just identifying the asymptote. So now, um, where's the other asymptote? The other asymptote is going to be uh, at the following location. We're going to write this into our little table here. Um, if this is the case, then my vertical, excuse me, my horizontal asymptote, my horizontal asymptote, I don't have to write that, it's right above there, is at y equals a over b. It's the ratio of the coefficients of the lead terms. So the ratio of the leading coefficients, a over b. So in our example, that would be y equals 3 halves. So at 3 halves, which is 1 and a half, which per this diagram or the scale that I've used, it's here. So this is 3 halves. Okay? And so if we go back and look at the Desmos graph that did force automatically, notice that I have x equals 2, that's this purple vertical line, right? And then y equals 3 halves which is the horizontal black line. I guess I can change the color on that if I wanted to, but I'm not going to. Notice how it says y equals 1.5. So, uh, well, that's interesting. So x equals two. So this orange function would look like this over if I did it manually. It would look like this. Uh, I want to change the other green. So it doesn't match up with the so closely to the uh, asymptotes. So this is mimicking the orange function over in Desmos, and it's poorly drawn, but that's okay. It'll work out. So uh, that's what our function looks like, and the as the vertical excuse me the horizontal asymptote is at y equals a over b, the leading coefficients. Now you can memorize this table. There are three ways to kind of go here. So one way is to memorize the table, and I have two more situations to deal with. Those situations would be these guys. M is greater than N, and M is less than N. Okay? M is greater than N. Actually, I want to do it in a different order, so I'm going to switch these around. M is less than N, and M is greater than N. And uh, those other two situations, it doesn't matter. It all works out kind of the same. So there's kind of three ways to think about it. You can memorize this table that I'm building. Or you can kind of follow suit with what I'm going to talk about now because I'm only going to sort of do it once, maybe touch on it when we build the table again for the next, the other two situations. So if I look at r of x again and just analyze it, r of x, and then look at the graph, 3x plus 1 over 2x, what did I say, minus 4? So imagine I put some gigantic number in 4x, some very, very large number. So 8 billion or whatever, something way the heck over there. If I do that, this 3 times 8 billion, right? Let's put a whole bunch of zeros and I'm going to dot, dot, dot it. Plus 1 over 2 times the same 8 billion, dot, 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 minus 4. Doesn't this plus 1 really kind of mean nothing? It sort of means nothing anymore because the number is so large that plot positive 1 just is negligible. It doesn't even mean anything anymore. And this denominator, this minus 4, it almost doesn't mean anything anymore because these numbers are so large. So to understand what's happening way the heck out there, I know that 3 times 8,000 or 8 billion or whatever I said before, divided by 2 times 8 billion, whatever I said before, disregarding that other stuff, is really these equal 1, so I get this 3 over 2. These, these numbers, so those, this plus 1 and minus 4 
cause this thing to not get to this asymptote. But way the heck out there, it's getting really close. It's in fact approaching this three halves thing. Now, if I put negative 8 billion in there, and the same thing sort of happens as I'm going to negative infinity, some large, large number, I'm still approaching three halves. It's just approaching from the bottom this time. So that's one way to look at it. Look at the lead terms because at very, very large and very, very small, that'll tell us what the horizontal asymptotes approaching. Does that make sense? Hopefully it does. Okay. So let's go over here and discuss this guy. When m is less than n, I get a function that looks like the following. And so we're going to slide down here, erase this nonsense left over from something, and we're going to write this m is less than n. And so I have a function maybe that looks like that one that I think the one I had up there was this uh, on the previous. You saw me delete it out of Desmos. Uh, I think I left the numerator the same, 3x plus 1 over, and I think I put x squared minus 5. Okay? So um, notice that the m is 1 and n is 2. So I do, in fact, have the situation where m is less than n. And so if m is less than n, this is what's going to happen. Um, we can analyze it in the same way that we did above and put a really large number in. And so if I put a really large number in, let's again say 8 billion or whatever, plus 1 over 8 billion squared, I forgot to put all the zeros in there, plus Oh, excuse me, minus 5. Well, again, these two numbers become negligible in my concept of getting very, 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 very large. So this becomes 3, 8 billion over 8 billion squared. Well, this number is getting so, so, so gigantic, and it's getting gigantic way faster than this one. This is actually approaching the value of 0, because I'm taking a number that's relatively large, and dividing by a number that's two, uh, it's a, a squared amount larger than the other one. And so, um, or you can think of it this way, if I cancel out or divide one eight billion divided by one of, the, one of the other ones, I'm gonna get three divided by eight billion. Well, remember, if I keep making this number larger as I go to the right, go to the right, go to the right, this number gets smaller. This approaches a smaller, 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 smaller number because this is a fixed value, so I'm getting closer to zero. On the other side, it's the same thing. It's just it turns out to be negative because this would be a negative 8 billion. So what happens is when m is less than n, my horizontal asymptote is simply y equals zero. And so the rule, if you want to memorize it, is y equals zero. Now, uh, you can also just analyze it like we did here, and if you want more proof, we can go back to Desmos, and we can turn these guys off, and turn these guys on, and we can see that that's what's happening. Now, if you're looking at this, you're going, well, wait, what the heck's going on here? Uh, I don't think I put the y equals zero asymptote in there, and so now it'll be in there, and it's red, okay? So now we got the screaming red y equals zero asymptote. It was at the x-axis anyway. Now you're looking at two vertical asymptotes. Why then? Why why would I have two vertical asymptotes? If you watched the other video, hopefully you did, um, you will understand. But we'll review it quickly here. Why do I have two vertical asymptotes? My denominator is what causes the vertical asymptotes, and so my denominator was x squared minus five, and I want to find out when that denominator goes to zero. So I set it equal to zero. I'm going to add 5 to both sides, oops, and get that, and I'm going to take the square root of both sides, which means x is equal to plus or minus the square root of 5. Or you could also think of this as a difference of two squares, and I can take one, the square root of the first term, and subtract the square root of the second term, 
and add the square root of the second term. And now I have a root here that's the square root of 5 and a root here that's the negative square root of 5. And so in either case, I get this. This is my answer, the two values that will make the denominator go to 0. And that causes me to have uh, vertical asymptotes at x equals negative square root of 5 and square root of 5. And so if we go back to Desmos, you can see that that's what I've written here. See the top two equations in the left column? x is equal to square root of 5 and x is equal to negative square root of 5. And that's this orange one and this blue vertical, the orange and blue vertical um, lines that are showing there. So that's situation two. So now we still have this table that we're building out. And so if m is equal to n, then it's the lead coefficient, ratio of the lead coefficients. If m is less than n, then it's y equals 0. And again, it doesn't, this table doesn't address the vertical asymptotes. Now what happens when m is greater than n. And this will actually tie up the third way to un, third way to go about remembering or understanding or executing these problems. Again, the first way is to memorize this table. The second way is to always analyze what's happening at the extreme values, infinity and negative infinity. Now the third way is this. I'm going to put it below here so we don't have to screw around so much. When m is greater than n. For example, if I have a rational function that looks like this, uh, let's say 3x squared plus, no, I don't want complex roots, minus 7. Okay? Whew, why did I do that? But anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, and I'm going to divide that by x plus 6. Okay? So again, note that this exponent, m, is greater than this exponent, n. 2 is greater than 1. So we have 2 is greater than 1. We've, we're in this situation here. So let's go to Desmos and graph. Uh, let's not graph it. Let's do this. I can actually do the division here. So let's do that division. We're going to do long division, even though we could do synthetic here. If you want, you should hit pause, maybe. Do the synthetic division or the long division, then hit play again and see if, see if, you can, see if it follows along and, work and you've done it correctly. So I'm going to put my zero term in here, and I'm going to do long division. Why am I choosing long division? Well, I've already told you that I like it better. But also, some of you may need to practice that or see this more frequently than synthetic. So I have to multiply this times 3x to make my first term identical to this one. And then whatever happens in the second part, 3 times 6 is 18, so I get plus 18x. Remember, I'm subtracting this term. So 3x squared minus 3x squared is 0. And then 0x minus 18x is negative 18x. Now I'm going to carry down my next term, negative 7. I have to multiply this x, this x, times negative 18 to make it identical to this term, negative 18x. And then I have to multiply this negative 18 times the 6. And why did I do that to myself? So 6 times 8 is 48. That's 108. And so positive negatives, I get negative 108. And remember, I'm subtracting this. So I get negative 18 plus 18, excuse me, negative 18x plus 18x, and that's 0. And then this ne uh, negative 7 plus 108. And so I get positive 101. So thinking back to the division algorithm, I get the following, 3x minus, excuse me, 3x squared minus 7 over x plus 6 is equal to my quotient, which is this guy, 3x minus 18, plus my remainder divided by my x plus 6. So this is the division of that rational uh, function executed. And in fact, if I wrote that function as r of x, these two things, this one and this one, are equivalent. They would actually graph the same way. If I put x values in, they would output the same numbers. This is just a different representation. It's almost like thinking about 102 divided by 3 is equal to, why did I choose that? I'm an idiot. 7 halves is equal to 3 and a half right? Think of this as an improper fraction. 
this has higher degree than that, and think of this as the mixed number version of that. Here's the whole number, and here's the fraction. They can't be simplified any further. I can't take 101 and divide it by x plus 6. It has to be a higher degree to actually do the division. Well, it could be equal as well. That's how I get the 3 halves, which I'll go over. So <clears throat> when we're talking about this situation where m is greater than n, you have to do the division. And so our asymptote is y equals the quotient. It is actually equal to the division, the, the, the quotient part, or the whole number part, or however you want to think about it. It's equal to this. So our asymptote is y equals 3x minus 18. Yes, it's a line. It's a line, not an actual horizontal. And so that's where we get this idea of an oblique or slant asymptote. So now I'm going to go put this in uh, Desmos so you can actually physically see it because graphing it's, or drawing it by hand will take too long and it's kind of crazy. So 3x squared minus 7. 3x, 3, 3. 3x squared minus 7. Come on, baby. y equals divide 3x squared minus 7 over, what was it, x plus 6, I think? x plus 6. And that's it. I want to put an asymptote at, what did I say, y equals, now I can't remember, 3x, I want to say, minus 18, if I recall correctly. And then there is a vertical asymptote at negative 6, so I get x equals negative 6. If you're not sure how we got that, you should go back and think about it. And then I'm going to zoom in and show you what this function looks like. So see the green slant asymptote and the orange vertical asymptote and see how the function fits in those little Vs, those little notches, okay? See how they fit in there. It's pretty friggin' cool, well, if you ask me. Um, and it's really cool how you can sort this out. And it's really cool if you just do a little division, you can sort of picture it. Now, I haven't sorted out how to do it analytically. So right now, to figure out whether I'm in which part of the graph I'm in, I'm going to kind of sketch this on the other side poorly over here. When I get this guy, uh, let's say this was my vertical asymptote, and I get this as my slant asymptote. When I get my function, to understand whether it goes in here and here, I have not yet sorted out. I'm sure somebody that's more experienced than me would say, oh, it's just this, it's just that. And a friend of mine and I have talked about it for a couple of years, and we've not sat down and done enough examples to justify our thoughts about it. So I'm trying to say, does the graph go there, or does the graph run this way? And those are not the only possibilities. Because your function, depending on what it is, could actually be um, this guy, the brown one. Or it could be, I'm running out of colors, the white one. So they could be both below the slant asymptote, both above, or alternating like the orange and blue. Now, again, I haven't sorted out analytically what is the easiest, best way to, to sort that out. Um, so right now, how I figure it out is I guess and check. I choose a number that's to the left and right of my vertical asymptote and put it into the function. If it's above the value that would generate from, what was it, uh, x minus 18? I think it was 3x minus 18. If it's above, so if I put it in, if I put uh, whatever value would be here into both this function, the slant asymptote, and this function, y equals, uh, what was it, the original? 3x squared plus 1 over x plus 6. I want to see if that was what it was. Uh, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Three squared, three x squared minus seven. Sorry, three x squared minus seven, minus seven. If I put the number in for both of these functions, I can figure out if this number is less than that number, then it's. If this number is less than that number, then it's above. If this number is greater than this number, it's below. So it's just kind of sorting that out. That 
I don't think you're being you know, I don't think you'll ever be asked ever be asked that for a slant asymptote. Um, but it, it might help you future math classes, calculus, etc. So really, this table, I want to expand. This table, if you wanted to learn it, you could copy that down and you can memorize that table and that'll give you everything you need to know. Actually divide. Now, I would say that actually divide for this one only, but here's the rub. You can actually not memorize this stupid table, and yeah, I think it's stupid, um, but it might help you get there as you're, as you're learning this. If you just do the division, you will get this if these two are equal. If you just attempt to do the division with this situation, you'll get zero because, for instance, uh, function, rational function equals if my term in the top, let's say, Let's even make it easier to see uh, 3 over x plus 2. I cannot divide x plus 2 into 3. Or if you can think about it, I'm going to erase this and do it right here. Um, x, uh, sorry. Uh, 3 divided by x plus 2. There is no number that I can div multiply x by that has a positive exponent to make it into a 3. So I can multiply it times nothing. And then what's my remainder? I subtract 0, get a remainder of 3, and so I get a um, division algorithm that looks sort of like this. 3 over x plus 2 is equal to 0 plus 3 over x plus 2. Here's my quotient. That's why you get this quotient. If I did the division with... You can hit pause anytime if I went too quickly, but I'm, I'm trying to make this shorter. If I had my initial function, no, go ahead. Uh, it was 3x plus 1 over 2x, right? If I take 3x plus 1 and divide it by 2x, I would have to multiply this times 3 over 2, because 3 over 2, 3 times 2 is 6, divided by 2 is 3x. And then I get 0, bring down the 1, and now I'm going to multiply this times nothing to get that. So I get a remainder of 1. So I end up getting um, 3 halves plus 1 over 2x. And so here's my quotient, 3 halves. Well, wasn't that the ratio of the lead coefficients? So instead of thinking about all this stuff as I have to memorize this table, you can simply think about it as like, do the division. And even if that, even if you don't remember that, or don't actually do the division out, doing the divi thinking about it as doing the division might remind you that it is, hey, in this situation, it's the ratio. If it's in this situation, it's zero. In this situation, unfortunately, I actually have to do the division. All right? So that's it for this video. Again, I apologize that it's long, but it is a fairly dense topic. Have a good one.